Thank you so much for coming out on a snowy Sunday morning hungover. It's wonderful to be here. Um, you're at the panel, um, Fighting for the Things Climate Can't Change. I hope it's the right panel for you. Uh, we have an amazing group of um, discussants here. I'm very excited. My name is Lena Servostova. Um, I run a strategy firm in New York focused on social innovation and culture. And I am proud to work with Josh Fox for the last couple of years, um, including on the film, How to Let Go of the World and Love All Those Things Climate Can't Change. I think I said that right? Almost. Pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Um, the I longest title at Sundance. Um, distinguished for a lot of reasons, but that's one of them. And um, we have an amazing panel today. Um, we have, I'm going, to I'm going to let them introduce themselves. I'm not going to read bios. Um, and then we're going to get into a discussion. We'll have a Q&A um, about climate change and how we can all fight it. Um, the first panel we have is um, Suzanne Hunt, who's a renewable energy expert who flew all the way. She dodged the storm in New York. Yes. And got her mom to drive her to Buffalo to get here. So... Please give her a hand. <laughs> Suzanne, please introduce yourself. I, yeah, I never thought I would go to Buffalo, New York to avoid snow in Charlotte. <laughs> that was interesting. It was one of those who's busy, who can actually leave right now and drive. Um, so Lena asked me to say a few words to kind of set the stage for the panel discussion. And so before I dive into what climate change is and how we solve it, how many folks have seen the film now? Woo! Okay, so almost everybody. So I, uh, I do environmental work. I, I'm not going to introduce myself. I want to make sure we have as much time as possible um, to talk about the issues. Um, and I think one of the, I think all of the stuff that Josh and I have been talking about, and the reason we met is because even though we have like often technical backgrounds, and many of the people I work with have technical backgrounds, we've all kind of gone through that emotional journey that was featured in the film and come to the point where we realize that um, it's actually the human dynamics that we have to tackle right now. It, it, it's not the technical issues. We have the technical solutions. Um, and it was our big brains that got us into this mess. So it's time to engage this, our spirits and our hearts and figure this out as a, as a, as a really as a creative, brilliant community. So that's what this, this whole movement, this is what all of Josh's work, what about all of our work together is, is about. So now that I've said that, let me talk about a few of the technical issues. Um, I think people get overwhelmed with climate change because it's, it is overwhelming um, and the causes are myriad and the solutions are myriad, but you can boil it down into essentially two thirds of the problem is how we power everything. It's, it's, how we, it's how we, where we get the energy and how we produce it. And then the other third is, is how we feed society. So it's how we power society and how we feed society. So if you're trying to boil it down into something manageable, just start with your life and how you get your food and where it comes from and you know, start growing herbs and, and have fun with your neighbors and create a little community garden and do all that fun stuff. That, and, and then it's how do you get your power. So, um, so now that we've gotten over, the, it's not overwhelming anymore. Um, <laughs> Uh, another part of climate change, I think most people kind of figure we have time because things change gradually. But in nature, there are tipping points. So, you know, you can add heat to water and, you know, for a long time it just gets warmer and warmer and warmer. And then suddenly it hits the boiling point and it turns to a gas. Um, so that's the way the climate system works. We, things will change grad gradually at times and then at times we hit these tipping points and things change abruptly. So we are in, right now in the race to avoid some of these catastrophic tipping points. Um, in terms of also setting the stage, one of the things that makes me most crazy about all of this is that the world's governments are still subsidizing fossil fuels at massive rates. Um, so when I'm out in communities and often rural conservative communities where they have this space to install huge solar arrays and wind farms, um, people get really excited. But the pushback that I get is that people don't want public money going to subsidize energy. They don't want it going to subsidize clean energy. And then so I always start my talks with people by letting them know that the governments of the world are subsidizing fossil fuels using their tax dollars at $5.3 trillion a year globally, every year. And so in the United States, and, and these are numbers from the International Monetary Fund. So in the United States, they conservatively estimate that 
our government subsidizes fossil fuels at about $700 billion every year. And they, they say these numbers are incredibly robust. They stand behind them. So when you talk about renewable energy and the subsidies that support renewables, you know, they're trying to break into a market that's highly subsidized and highly entrenched. So um, in terms of, you know, we're hitting all these tipping points, um, we're approaching tipping points in, in nature and in the climate, but we're also, and I think we've already hit tipping points in the solution side. So every year for the last three years, more renewable electricity generation capacity has been installed worldwide than all fossil and nuclear combined. And that's just the new reality. So that's a tipping point we've hit. Uh, renewable sun and wind are starting to outcompete fossil in markets all over the world. Like that's history. I mean, we just won that fight, even with the subsidies. So that is, we're just, we're, we're up over that hill, and now we just have to figure out how to, go, in every community, how to make it work, you know, which companies, which technologies, um, and how to finance it. So I think I'll pause there, and then we can come back to... Um, yeah, thank you, Susan. We'll get deeper into that. Um, speaking of community, Arya Doe, who, for anybody who's seen the movie, Arya's in the film, um, in a force and a presence. Um, Arya's with the Action Center um, and deeply steeped in community. Can you tell us about your work? Sure. Uh, I have one quick question. How many people have heard of Far Rockaway? Oh, very good. Very good. Well, I'll, I'll tell those who haven't a little bit about us very quickly because it threads the needle into why I'm here and what we think we can do to further this movement. Far Rockaway is based on an 11.5 mile peninsula. And we always say it's a microcosm of anything you'll find in the U.S. On one side, you have your multimillionaires, some billionaires, but you know. And in the other side, you have your middle class folks um, who are doing all right. There's a home, kids are in college, you know, those type of things. And then in the middle, you have folks who 65% of them live 200% below poverty level. And keep in mind, it's 11.5 miles. So you have some kids with their nose pressed up against the window watching other kids get ballet and French and all of this. 15 years ago, my husband and I decided to take a stand. Take a stand. We left our corporate jobs. We cashed in our 401ks, and the two of us in the basement started the Action Center. It was based on the premise that all parents, regardless of your hue, regardless of your orientation, regardless of your religion, regardless of your financial status, we all want our kids to do better than we did. We want, all want them to be able to live up to their full potential. And we've always stayed with that mention. When Sandy hit, we had been there for 12 years, garnering the trust of the community. What we say, we do. We live in the community. We live on the end. Yes, our kids are in college, and we have a home. But our commitment was in the middle in anything we ever said we did. So when Sandy hit, and we told our community, we will not leave you. We knew you would be left behind. We had a choice to fly out. We chose not to fly out, and ended up feeding thousands, almost hundreds of thousands, and keeping them alive through a grassroot effort because the government really wanted everything to stop so it wasn't shown that this community had been forgotten, this non-squeaky real community. And in was Josh, and you saw the rest from, you know, from in the movie, but there's this deep connection because what happened to us was a result of climate change. And when you are poor and living 200% below poverty level and having to drink out of fire hydrants when, um, when Sandy hits, your basic tenet is survival. How do I get my child diapers? How do I get uh, to feed them? This is every day, even a thousand days after Sandy and even a thousand days before. So how do you tell somebody like that that solar energy is important when you're trying to make sure that your child gets fed? And that's the importance in threading that needle because we can show the relevance. I think we proved it in the meeting that we had in Far Rockaway in May. In that audience was a choir. You are the choir. You know about solar energy. You know about renewable energy. You know what the, what the climate is doing. And the choir is used to lead other people into the same song. But when you're poor, you may not be hearing the same notes. But if we say solar energy, if you had it, you have $50 more a month to get your child's shoes. You have $500 more 
a year to maybe get some educational classes. You'll be able to lift up and rise up. And we did that. And in the meeting that we had on renewable energy, yes, half the room was the choir, but the other half were mothers who didn't know how they were going to be able to feed their children the next day. And they were shouting for change and shouting for renewable energy. So it's possible to get them to sing with us. And it's important. Thank you, Aria. Our next panelist is Clara Vondrich, who's with Divest Invest Philanthropy. Um, could you introduce what that means? I sure can, but I'd like to first start by giving a huge shout out to my dad, who turned 85 today. Um, yeah, Yari Vondrich, he's um, a Czech immigrant who uh, came from a farmer's family where they didn't waste a single scrap. They recycled everything. Sustainability was their mantra. And those are the kinds of values that I've been imbued with. So thanks, Dad. So how many of you have heard of the fossil fuel divestment movement? How many of you heard of the fossil fuel divestment and clean energy reinvestment movement? <laughs> All right. Well, so I had something called Divest Invest Philanthropy. And essentially, back in 2011, the climate community was kind of broken after the failures of Copenhagen and of uh, cap and trade in the US. And um, a couple of foundations got together and decided that a new way was needed, a brand new path-breaking way was needed. And so drawing on a core innovation of the anti-apartheid era, where divestment was used successfully in order to convince universities and other mission-based institutions to stop doing business with those companies that were driving apartheid. Similarly, our movement decided we would use that same mainstream financial power to call on institutional investors around the world to stop investing in the companies that were destroying the planet. So that was in 2011. We started with a few coal campaigns on college campuses. And in four years, that movement has blossomed to not only college campuses, but foundations, cities, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds like Norway's, dozens, if not hundreds, of faith-based groups around the world. The Pope's encyclical, though not a explicit call for divestments, made clear that this is our only planet, our only home, and drastic measures were needed to adapt. So we were so proud to announce that in, uh, in Paris, our movement writ large, with all the sectors that I mentioned, now has amassed $3.4 trillion in assets. And that's real money, you know? And this is also coming from 50 billion just one year ago. So that's a 75 or so fold increase in those assets under management in just one year. And I think the power of divestment really comes from the fact that it gives people agency. It doesn't rely on government intervention. It doesn't rely on policymakers to get their act together. You and I all have something to divest or are part of institutions that can divest, that we can pressure. So I call on everybody here to get behind this strong people's movement. You can go to divestinvest.org to learn more. You can sign up personally. You can pledge your own um, assets. I have moved all my money. Well, like I have much, but um, <laughs> my, my, my small little bit of money into some green mutual funds that are doing fine. Um, and it's just something that's available for all. So I, I call it, that's one of the very basic things that each one of us can do. And um, it's, it's a really nice dovetail with what Josh is doing because his grassroots efforts are so essential. You know, if you had asked me 10 years ago when I was just getting out of law school, um, whether people's movements or grassroots um, were that vital to the climate fight, I actually would have said no. I had high hopes in sort of the big policy mechanisms like cap and trade because they're sexy from, from, from a perspective of massive change. If you can change the entire top level United States policy, then think about all the sort of you know, benefits that you'll have. The problem is we have a political system that gets in the way of that. And the people are tired when their own leaders don't listen to them. So what I've seen in those intervening 10 years and being an activist involved with Keystone and being an activist involved in the, in the gas fights, I've seen the power of the people firsthand. Mm -hmm. So. Claire. Claire, before we go to Josh, can you just give us a minute on um, what happened in Paris, particularly with the people's movements? Sure. Um, so I was in Paris, and it was um, a really beautiful thing because so many people had low expectations. And on the flip side, there was a strong sense that we had to have high expectations because this was the last best hope for countries to come together while there was still time. So what we saw in Paris was not only an affirmation of the two-degree threshold that governments agreed to in Copenhagen, that is that 
climate change, global warming cannot warm more than two degrees to maintain a somewhat habitable place for us to live, not to mention all the animals and plants. Um, but not only did we see a reaffirmation of that target, but we actually saw increased ambition with uh, aspirational target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And 1.5 degrees Celsius arguably would be enough to keep the island nations from going completely under. So that was significant. And also in the preamble to the agreement for the first time, they recognized basic human rights, climate justice, and a range of other things that our community has been fighting for very hard. Um, there was, you know, it wasn't all, you know, puppies and rainbows because in the operational text, those same human rights and climate justice um, language and, and, and um, commitments were not included. But as a lawyer, I think that the language in the preamble where they are explicitly stated could be used effectively against governments should they not respect those commitments. Josh Fox, who is the director of How to Let Go of the World and Love All Those Things That Climate Can't Change. Okay. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, thank you for being here. Um, six years ago today, we opened, premiered a little film at Sundance called Gasland. And so it's also our birth thing. Um, but uh, that led me to making a sequel to Gasland 2, but it, to touring all across the, the nation and all across the world for the last six years. Um, myself personally going to 350 or so different cities. The film going in the community context to thousands of different uh, community screenings and house parties and all of that. In addition to, of course, the incredible distribution might of HBO, um, which brought it to 40 million homes. So it's been, uh, <laughs> uh, Gasland was a film, you know, that was made for about $5,000 or something like that, and then ended up in 32 countries with 50 million people watching it. And so what I've seen though, is that the combination of what happens when you have this incredible big media presence and Sundance um, and HBO paired with a real commitment on the ground to working with grassroots people. Um, the movies have come out of the grassroots. They have come out of these movements. The movement has taught me and told me where to go next, right? Because when people started to report they could light their water on, on fire endemic, Pennsylvania, all of a sudden someone told me they could do it in Colorado and then in Wyoming and in Canada and then I just go to those places. And the same is true of this film, How to Let Go of the World and Love All the Things Climate Can't Change. Problem is, climate change is totally different than fracking. When I started to get into this, it was a similar kind of ambition. Oh, let's just look at this. And we, by the way, won against the frackers and banned fracking in New York State and banned fracking in the Upper Delaware River Basin. And we have a banned fracking movement on the march across the world. We won in France. We won in, it, well, it's in, it's in California, but and it's gonna, we're, gonna, we're working on it. Um, so we have that movement presence and we know where these fights are occurring. Climate change, the, the bad news. When I started work with uh, an interview, Bill McKibben, Michael Mann, Lester Brown, uh, Petra Shocker, these incredible climate scientists, they told me, you know, we've already warmed the earth by one degree. We've got another half a degree in the pipeline already, in the sky. The CO2 that's already up there is gonna continue to warm the earth for several decades. <sighs> So we're already at 1.5, if we turned off everything right now. Two degrees, you uh, start a process whereby we're in for five to nine meters of sea level rise. That means basically New York City goes underwater, Philadelphia, Boston, Washington, DC, all of, half of Florida is gone. Um, these are impacts that are so devastating and so despairing when you really look deeply at them. At two degrees, we lose 30 to 50% of the species on the planet. And the movie and me in this journey of learning about climate change sort of hits a brick wall at you know, 100 miles an hour and then I just stop. Because I had to start to look at the things that climate can't change. <laughs> Those are the things that we know are going to be very deeply difficult. And as Tim DeChristopher says in the film, we're gonna be navigating through the most intense and difficult period of change that humanity's ever seen. And it's too late to stop a lot of that stuff. What do we have left over? What do we have that climate can't change? And these are these civic virtues and values that emerge in all these climate fighters that we meet all across the globe. 
It's in the indigenous environmental uh, monitors in the Amazon investigating oil spills um, in the deepest parts of the jungle. These are exemplars of courage. So courage is a thing that climate can't change. Um, Aria Doe talking about communities that feel safe, secure, and loved. Love is a thing that climate can't change. So is community. Um, these are the things that we made our film about. Um, going to six continents and 12 countries uh, with the Pacific climate warriors battling against the coal industry, with people in China who are speaking out um, at peril of being imprisoned, you know? And that's a, a testament to uh, human rights. Um, and talking about innovation and solar, these are the things that climate can't change. And what we hope to do is continue to fight those battles and inspire people um, by taking the film directly to them. Um, but also by having that a sense of moral and ethical, I think, and heart-based investment to go along with all the other uh, pieces of investment, right? Because there are communities, and we're going to get into this, that are currently battling the fight of their lives, as we know, against fracking, against pipelines, against frack gas power plants, against LNG terminals to liquefy natural gas and send it abroad, against compressor stations, against fracking fields, against mountaintop removal. The whole nation, in one way or another, is under siege by extractive industry still. And the clean power plan of President Obama, although they were sign very significant in Paris campaigning, actually facilitates a transition from coal, which is really the worst awful fuel, to not renewable energy, which we would like, but to gas because it sets a ceiling for CO2 that coal plants can't survive, but it doesn't adequately regulate methane, which is 86 times more powerful than CO2 in the atmosphere. And when you use gas, you're leaking methane, straight methane, all the way into the atmosphere to the point to which it's actually the worst fuel with respect to climate change. This is new information. DC and the plant is 10 years behind. So what we're seeing is 300 frack gas power plants that are being proposed for the United States, thousands upon thousands of miles of frack gas pipelines, and communities like the ones that we're from. I've got a compressor station that just got proposed for 15 miles from where I live for a, power plant, for a pipeline that wants to expand to build a power plant 50 miles from where I live. And we know those people, and that's happening across America. Across America. And we want to be in as many of those dogfights as we can. And that means we have to instill ourselves with some of these values that are going to see us through, right? And hopefully the film will help that. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's get a little deeper into this question about what communities need and what they can do. What I, find, what I found really interesting about the film and what this panel is saying, there's a certain level of um, interconnectedness, right, that is needed internationally, through regions, through sectors, all of this. There's a, there's a sense of connection, of community, of, um, and of understanding how different parts of the movement can work with each other. This panel represents so many different facets of the movement, renewables, community grassroots, investment, divestment, legal frameworks, storytelling and culture. From your perspectives, what, is, what are the most urgent needs? When we're looking at sort of post-Paris, we're in a post-Paris framework, um, there was ambition, there was hope, but there was also, there's still more work to do. What are the most urgent needs from your perspectives um, that communities, that your own communities need to do to sustain this momentum? Well, well let's just go down the line. Oh man, how much time do we have? Uh, About a minute. <laughs> in a minute. I, I mean, I think, I think one of the things I would say is that people need to figure out what gets you know, the fire in their belly going, gets them excited to get out of bed in the morning, and do that. So for Josh, it's filmmaking. Um, for I, it's community building. So I think, for me, I think a lot of people say, well, you know, I think from my vantage point, the most important thing is that we stop all the, the fossil fuel infrastructure. So all you people that are deploying solar, stop and help us. This is the most important thing. And it doesn't, because it feels like it, because it feel, because you, you know, your home is threatened. And, or you, know, you say, no, 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 but from my vantage point, like, until we prove the marketplace and we prove that these technologies can scale, then there's no way we can stop those pipelines. And, and the answer is we need all of it, and, and we need to activate ourselves and everyone around us. Um, so I think rather than spending, and I just spent 12 years in Washington, D.C. I've worked for, for all of the big NGOs. I've worked for government agencies. I've worked for private equity firms. So I've seen this from lots of vantage points. And I think that um, 
we have to stop figuring out the smartest strategies and just start doing everything within our power, within our little sphere or big sphere of influence to solve this. And I think we, because, you know, it would be so much easier if the United States would actually just put a renewable energy strategy in place. It would make all of our lives so much easier. So, you know, we put, and myself too, we've put so much effort and in, in, in energy into that. But at this point, we're out of time and we have to just start, you know, doing everything and growing our own food and putting panels on our houses. And then the only other thing, since I, the, the other thing I would say is that I don't mean to be Pollyanna. I mean, there are real legitimate policy and financial barriers and technical barriers. Um, but until you start trying to make the change, you don't know exactly which ones are most important. And then when you find them, you just link up with other amazing people and you, you figure them out. I think to keep the momentum going, we have to realize that there is a larger army to be built. And there are foot soldiers who are ready to join the foray. They're just asking, they're just waiting to be asked and waiting to understand. And that's why I think one of the, the real beauty of this movie is it is a love song to the earth, but it's a love song to every one of us. And there's something in it, no matter where, where you come from, that you can be touched in. And what I'm hopeful for is as the 100 city, city tour goes through, that in each hamlet, in each place that you go, there are groups like the Actions Center. There are groups that speak the language of the silent army and can speak that, that language to that army and get them to join you and to join us and to join the movement. Because all politics is local and there is nothing more elegant than a mother who had to use water to mix her baby's formula and she's worried about it and she asks the local politician that's telling her it's okay, well then you drink a cup and watching them say no. That, that, that's more powerful sometimes than the president and other people getting there and saying, no, it's okay. You know, so all politics is local. There are armies that are waiting to be asked, and there are people who speak that language and want to join the movement. Thank you. Well, I don't mean to be contrarian, but um, I don't think we have time to just throw a bunch of you know, jello at the wall and see what sticks. I guess jello wouldn't really stick, but anyway, bad metaphor. You guys are so good at metaphors and yeah, still too tired. Um, I think we need to keep our eye on the prize and that is greatly accelerate the clean energy transition. Um, it's like the Greek god Janus, he's got two faces, you know, divest, invest. We need to transition now to 100% renewable energy. And that is a message that I think needs to be told. And there's still a huge imagination gap. Many people don't think we have the technology to get there. They think we need natural gas, that we need carbon capture storage, that we even, God forbid, need geoengineering, you know, putting particles in the air and hoping that they'll cool the earth. And who knows what unintended consequences that would have. So I'm really, stoked that we have Mark Jacobson here from Stanford. Um, he is the author of 100% uh, renewable plans for all 50 states and 139 countries around the world. He shows how we can get there with existing technologies. No breakthroughs in energy storage needed. With existing technologies and sophisticated grid integration, we can get there. And so I really encourage you to look up his work. Um, I think 100% renewables now is the message that we all have to focus on. Okay, thank you. We'll hear hopefully from Mark. Okay, just very briefly, because we, are, we do have actually a plan, and I think it's a really gr considered plan that's taken six years to kind of formulate, but I'm going to wait on that for a second and just say, apart from participating in that, which we're going to ask you to do, um, the way this happens is not... Um, there's, a, there's a ladder of engagement, right? There's like, okay, I just clicked on that on the website. Oh, I filled out this box. Oh, I, I watched this movie. And there's that kind of thing that happens to you that helps dawn the consciousness. But really, actually, what's needed now is your time and your volunteer capacity one or two hours a week, I would say, at minimum. We're talking about the planet Earth. <laughs> there's not really much more important than that. So it's about... And I know, look, when I started Gasland, it was because the, the fracking industry was invading my area, and I wasn't in concern with these issues at all. So for me, it was like I went to a local meeting of the Damascus Citizens for Sustainability, a group of people that were like not an NGO. They were just like my neighbors hanging around on Sunday mornings at their coffee table and discussing what they were going to do about this fracking thing. And I said, hey, can I make you a five-minute YouTube video? Maybe that'll help get the word out. 
<laughs> three movies later, <laughs> you know, um, like that project got a little bit more expensive. But what I'm trying to say is that it was that entrance point in the movement and saying, I can volunteer this little skill that helped mm -hmm. push that whole conversation. And it's a great place to be because the movement is an amazing, fun thing. There are parties, there's rallies. You know what I mean? You meet people, you fall in love, you break up, you get so depressed that you chain yourself to something to stop the fossil fuel industry. Um, you know, like that's, but there's a, what I'm trying to say is it, you have to take that step because it's transformational. And what we're talking about here is not something that's as simple as being an audience member. You have to be participant. And that participation, it, it, you think, oh my God, you watched in the movie, one person said, well, do we have to go out into the port of Newcastle in Australia and hand carve canoes and try to blockade coal ships? Because I don't think I could do that. And I was like, well, you know, probably five years ago I couldn't do that either mm -hmm. but the idea that you are on the way there and you're gauging where you're on where you're on the way too you know what I'm saying and the, the way you know that is by working with your neighbors getting involved with the local groups and that'll tell you the next step I really have faith in that mm -hmm. so it's about joining that mm -hmm. and it is the greatest thing that we can achieve because you're gonna you're gonna make the friends that will stand shoulder to shoulder to you for the rest of your life mm -hmm. before we um before we turn to the audience. Uh, if you are, just a note, if you are tweeting or putting things on Facebook, make sure you um, say at Kickstarter. And also our hashtag is let go in love. So it's hashtag let go in love for the uh, film. Um, Clara, you said something about the imagination gap. Um, when we were preparing for this panel, every single one of you when we talked, talked about a gap uh, between imagination and reality or imagination and expectation. Um, between the haves and have-nots. There are significant gaps in the climate movement as it exists. Can you give me, again, just another minute, but can you give me a minute about, from your perspective, what, are, what is the most significant gap, and how do we bridge that? Uh, well, I already touched a bit on, I think, the gap in the movement between the solutions implementers and the, the folks that block the bad stuff. And I think we're just through personal relationships and through effort and we're, we're working on bridging that. And one of the other big gaps is, I think, between what's possible and all of this money that's being divested and all of these incredibly talented people who have track records of, 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 of actually solving problems. Um, and then in the disconnect between all this money that we hear about and the resources that people on the ground at ground zero need, that to me that's the most dangerous disconnect because there are so many incredible effective people that could solve so many of these problems um, if they had any support if they had resources and you know then you know you I hear about all this money that's out there and then and I know in the investment community there is a lot of money but there's a disconnect in uh, between the parameters with which those billions of dollars can be invested and the size of the solutions and so um, finding resources to pay for the time and effort to to aggregate those investment opportunities and that kind of thing so um, I would, I would pass it on to you. That. <laughs> yeah, because I would totally agree. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it, there, there are two things, and it kind of, it really does segue from what she says. One is that community uh, needs to be thought of as a budget line. You know, because oftentimes we think of how do you build the solar, solar things, all of the, all the material things that need to be built. But when you are a nonprofit, you are a nonprofit, and, and typically you are poor, but maybe poor in dollars, but rich in spirit. And it actually makes you stronger because if you got to fight for your kids to get in a good school or for them to eat or whatever, those are the strongest soldiers. And if you're made to understand that the earth is going to die and what you're going to leave your kids is going to be nothing, those are the strongest ones like the the person that I love in uh, Somalia we won't drown we won't die we say the same thing in the Rockaways we will dance we will live and we will rise above the storm so it, it needs to be always factored into everything that is done even if you're talking about it at this level of that level it's an important component but sec also second to that though is then we my responsibility and anyone who's in the same position as I am is to make sure that that communication is drilled down or drilled in to this army that we want to help join you. So we have that responsibility and then we ask too that 
um, that we're part of the whole process. We want to be. Totally echo all of that. Being in philanthropy, I saw firsthand how they poured millions, if not billions of dollars into high level policy fixes that went nowhere. And only recently have we seen them start to move some money to the 350s and the Avazas of the world, but it's still a pittance and we still need to ramp it up super fast. One of the major gaps that, that I see and that I've been exposed to is this idea among investors that if they divest, they're gonna, they're gonna actually undercut their financial performance. And we have study after study now showing that's not the true, and it's for a number of reasons. One, coal stocks are in terminal decline, they're in free fall, they're not coming back. Um, and natural gas is a roller coaster of volatility. And as an investor, is that really a sound strategy? Yet we still battle the status quo thinking that you have to have a fully diversified portfolio, that's the, the secret of modern portfolio theory, you have to invest in every sector. Um, and we're saying no, you've gotta cut out a sector, and you've gotta ramp up investment in another sector. And all of our 145 foundation signatories report that since divesting and starting this process, their bottom lines are doing just fine. So that's a gap that we're working on really filling. And it's, you know, with financial regulators, with policymakers, and with money managers that, you know, really unfortunately still control a lot of um, our fates down on Wall Street. So getting that message is, is one of my core, core goals. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> so... There is a formula that I perceive to uh, making this all work, and it's a bunch of different things that have to be in the same place. For renewable energy to take root, we need to do that, first of all, in a democratic way, in a, in a way that supports our communities rather than detracts from them, right? Because actually the people who fight fracking fight wind farms also as the NIMBY part of life if they come from without. Right? If the ideas originate in the communities, they have a much better ride. So here's what I think. You need to have a grassroots activist component on the ground. You need to have a good legislative environment for the de de development of renewable energy. That's number two. You need to have um, the technical expertise to advise about what to build. Because when you've got like two frack gas power plants that are peaker plants that are going into Denton, Texas, for example, which is, this is a real example, um, you know, uh, a, a town that banned fracking by referendum, even though it's the birthplace of fracking in Texas, um, you know, and they have now facing down two frack gas power plants that the city council wants to build, you need an expert to tell you what to build instead. How do you make solar that will translate to that amount of power, expertise, that's important. And the, and, and the fourth piece is you need investing. Um, there's people doing this work all over the country. They need to be invested in, in terms of time and resources and actual dollars, right? So a lot of this um, hoping is that we get some of this divest invest to invest in those communities. Yeah, that's the, that's the, that's the hope. And that the idea here that this is a very simple formula and that's what our tour is all about I keep alluding to it because I'm not supposed to talk about it yet. It's but um, time. Is it time? It's Should time. Should I just do that? Go ahead. Okay, well, okay. So here's the, here's the deal. Um, we are launching here at Kickstarter uh, a campaign for $100,000 uh, as part of uh, other money we're also trying to raise. Um, you know, but the crowdfunding part of it, we're trying to actually get to, towards a million dollars. So if the people out there uh, want to be extra generous, we can blow past our goal. But it's called the Let Go and Love Tour. Pretty awesome name, pretty awesome t-shirt, also one of those things that you could get on Kickstarter as a reward. But, um, you know, that tour is going to go to a hundred cities in the United States that are in the middle of one of those fights, right? A fight against a pipeline, like the Constitution Pipeline, which stretches across the top part of New York State. The Constitution Pipeline, uh, right next to, of course, the Bill of Rights Waste Pit. Um, ironic name, um, or the Ned pipeline that goes and cuts across the Berkshires, or the LNG terminal in Cove Point, Maryland, or the LNG terminals that they're fighting in Seattle and in Portland and um, uh, British Columbia, or um, I know British Columbia is not in America, gas but, storage but, but gas Lake. storage facility in Seneca Lake, for example, where they're going to um, put, they're planning to uh, install a huge underground uh, uh, gas storage. Under a lake that's a drinking water source for 100,000 people. Californians in the room, and most people at this point know a little bit about gas storage from this place called Porter Ranch, which has erupted a geyser of methane. It's now the largest single source of climate change emissions in the world. 
in a state that um, should be, is being run by a climate leader who should be shutting down all fracking, Jerry Brown, um, especially in Kern County, because a lot of these uh, are minority communities. There are a hundred of these battles. The good news is there are amazing people fighting those battles on the ground, and we know them <laughs> because we've just spent the last six years touring our asses off, <laughs> getting to know them, giving the gas land films for free in the community settings. And some of these community screenings will show up a thousand people. We had 1,700 people in P Pittsburgh come to a single screening of gas land. We had 1,600 people in a town on a rainy Tuesday night in a town called Williamsport, PA, which is 30,000 people in the whole region. 3% of the town came to the movie that night. We, we know how to do this. What we want to do on this tour is bring those four elements that I just mentioned directly to those people. We are lucky to have Suzanne Hunt as an advisor. We are lucky to have Mark Jacobson as an advisor. We are lucky to have Ella Joe from the National Renewable Energy Labs and their supercomputers dedicated to figuring out the problem in Denton, which they've already done and made a counterproposal. So those activists on the ground, I mean, filmmakers, we can't figure that stuff out. We need to hand the plan to that community and say, we've got the alternative right here, and it's certified National Renewable Energy Labs. How do you like that? And then the people who are really on the take get exposed, and you get to fight with them in the grassroots. So the, this plan is to take the film there and the film as that event where all the people in the town show up as the catalyst. We have the discussion. We spend a couple of days. We do workshops. We teach the community how to individually go renewable. Which with some, We have partnerships with renewable energy companies. We have a partnership with an amazing uh, B Corp called Domino, which is a neutral third-party advisor that will tell you how to green your entire life, your whole house, for free. Um, these are the resources we want to bring to the fight, the things that we're talking about as this gap. That's the challenge now. And we're dedicating the next year of our lives to doing that and going to 100 places to we want to tip those scales. Um, and that's why we're raising money. Uh, we're, raise, we're, ma we're raising it in the nonprofit space. Um, and we're also, uh, by the way, in addition to the HBO, we have rights available <laughs> because we are uh, in this incredible partnership with HBO that is allowing us to do this grassroots tour and also allowing us to do a theatrical because we want to go to cities on that red line where we know quite possibly they're going underwater. We need to tell people. I don't think people in New York know. There are condominiums that are being sold all up and down the coastline of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, the hippest neighborhood in the world, and those mortgages are going to outlast the coastline, most likely. You know, People don't know that. So we need to do the awareness building piece of this, but also the people who are in the know. And there are hundreds of thousands of these people, like Aria said, community centers, activists, grassroots. You know, I know from talking to so many people, you know, um, they all say, can you connect me with Celebrity X? Because we need real money in our <laughs> nonprofit. And I'm like, the people have to do this. We have to do this together. And we have to make sure that that's our part of our civic responsibility. So that's why we're launching this campaign. It's a populist campaign. Um, it is like a presidential campaign. We'll probably go more places than the presidential candidates, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> it's exhausting, but the thing about it is we love it. We love doing it. It gives us so much juice every time. I'm like, oh God, I can't get out of bed. And then the audience comes, and then it's like the the, the thing that arrives is that force of community and that force of change that we've seen be so effective in so many places, we want to just continue it. Um, and this is, an, this is the day, this is the year. This year matters enormously because if we don't do this now, we are really, 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 really in more and more deep trouble. So thank you for that. And it's a positive thing to, to take part in. We want to know if you're one of those people who has that problem, we want to know we're going to go to you. If you're in that town that's facing down that power plant, tell us because we're, gonna, we're making that map now of where we're going. Thank you. Can I just underscore? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. We've got five minutes for questions. So. Okay. 
Um, we're going to turn it now to the audience for questions. There is a, there's a mic that's available. Um, while we find the mic, it's right up here in front is the first question. Um, and Clara, if you wanted to say something before. I just wanted to underscore um, everything Josh said in the sense that, you know, the Paris Agreement, while, while positive on some regards, it doesn't begin its implementation until 2020 which is three years after the IEA has said, we've got to peak emissions and start ramping down. And so if we're building 300 new power plants here in the US alone, there's no way we're going to meet our target. So I think his fight, getting those alternatives in the hands of policymakers and make sure that we're, we're you know, knocking that old, dirty, old guard dinosaur infrastructure off the table and going with the truly you know, clean, bright, prosperous, sun, wind, and water technologies of the, of the now and future, that's got to be a goal. And I think Josh's you know, plan, it really marries the two. And it, it's like kind of the life cycle. It's modeling the transition the world needs now. Yeah, I, I would just want to urge you, when you talk about a degree, to remind Americans who don't understand that we have a metric system everywhere else in the world what a degree of Celsius means right. in terms of, because they hear one degree and they just think it's nonsense. Uh -huh. They can't even imagine in their wildest dreams that one degree could even matter. And I think they need to know what one degree, what two degree, we're talking six, 10, you know. So I just, uh, it's not so much a question, just asking you, and I, I loved the film. I love all your stuff, but I, I, you didn't do that in the film. And I feel like American audiences just need to be talked down to because we lack the critical thinking skills that other people have. So that's, that's all I got for you. I think that's a really good point. And also the fact is we're talking about global average temperatures, right? And that means there's going to be wild swings in other parts of the world. Two degrees average, but in some places like the poles, it's going to be 10, 12, 14. That's another part of the well, message. Film we do that. Do that. Yeah. film does yeah. that. Yeah. We do okay. it, but it doesn't, what is a degree? Yeah, what is a degree? Next question. Yeah, um, I'm a Wall Street guy and uh, run a hedge fund that's environmentally sensitive. And I hear the four of you speak, and I've got an idea for you. And it's just an idea, and you can punch holes in it. But there's a, a, it's clear that grassroots activism globally is necessary to change minds and remove the $700 billion of tax and IDC subsidies of the drilling business. Uh, so I really encourage you to marry that to a really big financial idea that's sexy, like cap and trade. There's a $700 billion fund right now. This is just one example that is studying 90% of the natural gas wells in the United States to acquire them for pennies on the dollar. Why couldn't you take the natural gas business out of business overnight with oil prices, gas prices at all-time lows on an inflation-adjusted basis? with grassroots activism, and you're not going to have any compressor plants, you're not going to have any pipelines. Yeah. It's just an idea. Well, what, what's the idea part, though? Did you just the idea, to buy up all the gas wells at pennies well, on the dollar? We, while we're doing that. Low? You want us I to buy the gas idea. wells? Well, if, that's the missing link, uh, the economic part. You've got $3, billion, or $3 trillion of uh, endowments and foundations. If you can find, noodle through the replacement for the value of those assets, and just take 700 billion of it and wipe out natural gas and then have a replacement investment then you know you're you're starting something. I mean, Are you talking about wells in the United States? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it is a global market is the only caution. So I love this way of thinking and thinking big, uh, but I would just say we have to, we'd have to ponder this with more time. We can sit down and get a coffee and think about what portion of the market is the U.S. and how would that shift? You know, well, it's, it, it, sometimes it's like whack-a-mole. You hit one down and it yeah. pops up in Iran. Sounds Russia. like this is a conversation that should happen, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're make sure you find each other. Make, yeah. make sure yeah. you find each other after the panel. Um, I'm going to quit question on um, gamification and apps. Um, you've got Bicot that hit the market last year out of LA, and you've got, um, I think it's called Green House that was just launched by a 16-year-old to expose politicians and what dollars they're taking from lobbyists that just uh, hit, the, hit the papers this week. So what kind of, I mean, I think you have to break it down to consumers in a really digestible, mm -hmm. concise, fun gamification way so that it becomes personal. Um, there was a great app out of Germany that was on your carbon footprint. We don't really have anything like that here. We do actually. Okay. I don't want to interrupt yeah. you. Yeah, share. Can, or can I, can I take we'll this? post it. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so here's here's uh, a little piece of our history. Uh, for the last two years, we've been touring to bring renewable energy solutions um, with both a play and a, 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 a live event. And a, a friend of ours named Tom Dinwoody developed an app for his website Domino or MyDomino.com that would tell you everything that was wrong with your fossil fuel imprint in your life. And they did they sunk fifteen million dollars into it. And um, that, that app was built, and they test marketed it in a lot of places, and it totally failed. And the reason is, I agree, we need all this interactivity of media. Um, and we need that, the, especially the new technology. But you wouldn't buy a car with an app, probably. And that's the problem. The problem is, no, I'm not kidding. Not in the place, of, just, just hear me out for a second. There is no substitute. So Tom Dinwoody failed with the app, and then built a concierge service which holds your hand and teaches you all the ways that you need to do it. There was no substitute for a human being on the, uh, in that room with you or on the phone with you. And that's their new strategy to get this to happen. And what we're saying is, when we're in the room, when we're on tour, when we're in those communities, that is a super necessary part of this transformation. And what we're ta actually doing is the lo-fi part of it, which is like all of the things that happen when we're not staring at our phone. And, and I agree with you. We have those tools. And we have the app. And Domino app is still up and running. And it's amazing. You should check it out. But we got to be in the room. And that's why we're saying we're going these places. Because on a, on, watching a film on television or doing things on your phone, there is no substitute for being in the live event. It's part of our nature. And we don't have enough of that in life. So I would agree with you about the technology, but I also think that it's not just the technology that'll solve the problem. It has to be matched with showing up in rooms together, all of us together. And that is a process that is a little bit slower, but it is also called democracy. <laughs> and it's how we know and make sense of the world in a fundamental capacity. And that's the part of it that we are trying to accomplish you know what I mean? Other people are accomplishing things in other space, but this is a vital ingredient, and it works, and it has worked for the last six years to transform the world. We have time for one or two more questions. Um, is, there any, uh, is there another question back here? I, I can, while well, people are thinking, I mean, I would just add on to that, that you know, we're going through an energy revolution that's of this right now that is from fossil to renewables that is of the scale of going from a horse and buggy to a car or from gas lamps to electricity. I mean, this is, we are in the midst of this incredible historic transition. And without, and so one of the issues that I'm really concerned about is the ownership piece. So if huge hedge funds come in and, or if, you know, the same, um, entities or the same concentration of entities who control our, our energies now uh, control the future of energy. We haven't, we haven't solved the democracy issues, the society issues, and we've lost a huge opportunity. So the distributed energy generation paired with distributed ownership, that's, that's the true full revolution. And so this hard labor intensive, time intensive, money intensive work at the grassroots is not only essential to give the politicians the space to be brave to pass the policies that we need, but it also enables uh, grassroots ownership, which helps strengthen democracy and all those other things that we absolutely have to, to solve. So I'm going to ask the final question, I guess, in, in an, um, not to be reductive, but Josh, you've asked people to get involved with the campaign. That's one thing that people can do. They can join the Kickstarter. They can join the campaign. They can find out how to bring the film to their communities. Can the three of you sort of give one piece of advice to the audience on, on an individual level? What can they do for this fight? Suzanne? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I go back to wh what is your passion? You know, find your bliss and whatever that is, do it. Because that's where, you, you, where, that's where the magic starts happening. That's where the universe starts, starts you know, contriving in your favor. Um, so whatever your passion is, like, that's, that's where you should put your energy and that's where, you know, it, you cannot do this work and not hit an emotional brick wall. I mean, every single one of us who's done this work for our whole lives, you go into that despair. I was so glad you included that in the film because it is impossible to do this work if you're not doing it from a place of personal passion with a community of people where you're finding ways to bring joy into the work. It's otherwise, it just, it's crushing. And I would say, remember 
your connection. It's not a cliche that the weakest of, we are as strong as the weakest of, of us and we're as weak as the strongest of us. It's not a cliche. It's, it, from my perspective, we are all one body working together, but we forget that. We let the things that we've decided separate each of us as individuals, as humans, and as folks on this journey together, we let those things separate us. I would say dig deep within, and if you remember the connection between the man that's on the street with a cup, begging for a cup of coffee, or with Mark Zuckerberg, or however you say it, Zuckerberg, uh, <laughs> whatever, you know, yeah, what, because we are all the same, you know, and so, I I would say that, remember your connection, we are all the same, and when you do that, then you'll look at everybody with the same eye, we need to save the planet, because we're all going down if it goes down. Thank you. No um, so first things first, divest. Um, second thing, look, there's federal tax subsidies for solar panels, it's 30%. So everybody who owns a home has an opportunity to go there. There's also federal tax incentives for weatherization. Um, and, but if you're leasing, for example, you can also, you can buy into something called ethical electric. I think most states have that or some equivalent where you can, as a renter, actually guarantee that your power is coming from clean renewable sources. So those are some pretty concrete ways given we need to shift our energy system. Um, food is also really important. You know, agriculture and, and meat production is a huge, huge slice of the emissions pie. Um, I'm not going to tell you to go vegan. I'm, I'm, I'm a vegetarian mostly, um, but it's tough. I mean, I listened to the leader of PETA the other night and she was just, I mean, it was, it was just, it was, it was hard to listen to. And, and the videos that she showed of the poor calves being ripped from their mothers. I mean, man, it's, it's heavy stuff. Um, but even if we can just limit meat eating to, you know, once or twice a week, that would make a huge dent. Um, and then the last thing, and I'm probably preaching to the choir here in Park City, Utah, get outside, go into nature, feel that connection. You know, that's, that's my church. And I think that more and more people that have that experience start to have more reverence um, for all the things that we stand to lose with climate change. So if you want more information about any of their work, including Mark Jacobson and any of the panelists in our campaign, from our Twitter handle, Let Go and Love, we'll, um, we'll put up all of their information, their contact information, their, um, their organizations and such. So just go there, and it'll be the hashtag with Let Go and Love. So please find, please support their work. Please and find share, it. And share it. And share it. Um, and thank you so much for coming. This was really wonderful. Thanks. Thank you.